Today we're going to be having a look at the new simulation nodes in the experimental builds of 3.5. We're going to be building this pretty funky little mushroom growing thing. I want this to be uh, able to sort of interact with geometry so it'll grow, it'll try and grow upwards, but if it finds some geometry it's going to grow around it as you can see that. It's going to cover the surface. We also have branching happening and we also have an animation control so it starts slow grows out for the duration of the animation and then it's going to come to a stop so we can see that so there's a few things that we need to cover quite a few things we're going to be trying to build this whole node tree in this session there's a lot of things to get into here so let's jump in the version of blender that i will be using i will link it down in the description but it is one of these experimental builds I am using December 10th uh, 3.5 Geometry Nodes simulation build. And what this means, because this is experimental, is by the time that you watch this video, there may be parts of it which are obsolete, but the general thought process, the general movement that we are taking towards simulation in Geometry Nodes, this is probably, I hope, going to be consistent. So there may be additional functions, but the fundamental thinking should be the same. And if you're watching this soon, then it's just a fun project for you to use with simulation nodes. So a bunch of things for us to get into, some new things we've not met before. Let's jump in. Before getting into the tutorial, I just want to quickly mention a competition being hosted by our friends over at TrueVFX. It's a render competition to create a beautiful winter wonderland scene. Entry is open in the new year through January, and you just need to use these beautiful assets from TrueVFX and PBR Max in your work. First prize is valued at up to $620 and includes Blender Market products from TrueVFX and a subscription to PBR Max. For more details and links to the assets, check the description below. All right, first things first, we're going to need some geometry. This is just the standard startup, right? So I'm going to add a plane and a new geometry nodes tree, which I'm going to call Mushroom Simulation. I'm going to save this and we're going to be working with multiple objects today so I will just be pinning this node group just to make sure that it doesn't disappear as we move around. Let's also rename our object to be simulation and that's fine for now. Make sure you're saving as you go. This is really important when you're using experimental builds, using new features. They will crash if you do too many control Zs. If you, you know, There's just going to be some instability. This is a development build. So make sure you're saving. Save right at the start so you've got some auto saves going. And let's begin. I'm not going to be using the group input. We're going to be creating our own object. So let's start with that. This is just kind of our, our build up to doing the actual geometry nodes with the simulation. We need to start with a curved circle. And onto here, let's just do a set radius. And in front of that, let's use a curve to mesh node. I'm going to use another curved circle on here. Essentially, we have just made ourselves a torus. Set this like this. There we go. So we have a little donut going. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller, just so we're not taking up too much space. And then maybe 0.7. I'm going to reduce my minor radius here as well, just to something sensible. And I will just use a noise texture. 3D is fine, 2D would be fine as well. Let's use the, the factor, just plug that straight in there. Turn down my detail, turn down my scale until it's just general movements. There we go, something like this. Now, this is just because we might want to use this mesh later as the thing that the mushrooms are growing off or however you end up meshing it at the end there's so many options in geometry nodes we're just going to be using general spline skinning to give us the mushroom effect but obviously you can do stuff with sdfs and volume cubes and just all sorts of mesh generation so this is fine we are going to distribute some points on the surface and this is giving us our points let's reduce our density a little bit just so we don't have too much computation happening right at the beginning. I'm going to collapse this side. First things first, how do we even access the simulation? Shift A, we have a new section for simulation and we can see a simulation input and simulation output which also says add this first. I'm sure at some point it will be easier to link two things together. For now you have to add the output first like so and then when you add the input you can see I have this sort of convex hull frame being added here. And this is uh, great, basically. This just demonstrates where we have nodes which are inside the loop versus nodes which are coming in 
from outside. We will get onto that in just a moment. Let's just, as a first experiment and kind of the core mechanic of how we're going to grow these mushrooms, in our simulation loop, this is a serial loop. What this means is the data comes in from outside, comes through whatever functions you have happening, and then instead of just plugging directly out, it's going to basically keep looping back through. And it's going to do this however many frames you have stepped forwards, not from the start of the timeline, but just how many frames you step forwards. As soon as you ever go back with simulation nodes, even if it's one frame, it's not going to undo a frame because it hasn't cached anything in the current build. It's not cached anything. So anytime you go back, it will reset. So you only have kind of forwards computation right now, but this is how we can think of it, right? So every time, every time we step forwards, we do another iteration of anything which is inside this loop. And then we're just going to view the output. What we want to put inside this loop is an extrude. So mesh, extrude mesh, let's put that on here. Now, if I just change my bottom window here from an asset browser to a timeline, let's get rid of these two sides. And I'm also going to set my end frame something high, maybe a thousand. And I'll press home to just view the timeline properly. As I move forwards, we can see that nothing's really changed, but we do have an error on our extrude mesh. So it says input geometry has unsupported type point cloud. Let's just make sure that we've fixed this then. So the extrude mesh needs vertices, not points. So let's add a point to vertices node in here. And now if I step back to reset and I step forwards, now it's going to start working. Let's just erase all of these annotations. Instead of extruding faces, we need to extrude vertices. So now if I step back and forwards, we can see every time I go back a frame, it resets. And every time we step forwards, it loops. So if I just press shift space, then we can, uh, we can do that extrusion. All right, here's where it gets crazy. Let's go right back to the start here, just so we can count how many frames we've got. If I go and keep an eye on the spreadsheet. So I've got 40 vertices right now. If I go forwards one, we have 80. If I go forwards another one, we have 160, 320, 640, and so on, right? This is doubling every single time we move forwards. That's not really what we want. We want to add one step every time. But let's think about why this is actually happening. The mesh data that is coming back around this loop, we're basically telling it every single one of your vertices extrude the vertices. And that is clearly a problem because we don't want to extrude every vertex. We just want to extrude the top of the extrusion. I'm just going to make a bit of space around this. I want to plug this top into this selection, which means really I want to plug it into this simulation output and then have it come back through the simulation input. But we don't have any option to do this exactly. But what we do have is named attributes. So if I add a named attribute in here, you can see it's been added to our frame, our convex whole frame, just because it's showing that it is a sort of an integral part of the loop. We're going to be storing a Boolean on the point domain for the top and let's just rename this uh, attribute to be top. And now what I can do with this uh, is I can use the named attribute top, which is going to be a Boolean as my selection. So now rather than doubling each time, what happens if we push play is nothing happens. Okay. So we've gone from too many to too few, but we can kind of see that this is actually working in our spreadsheet. We can also see that we have an attribute top now. So it's being written, right? It's coming through the simulation loop. It's, uh, it's going through the extrude mesh and it's having an attribute stored on it. And then it is going back through. However, the extrude mesh has this attribute on it. And in the first instance, none of the geometry has this. So we need kind of a, a separate clause. So right now, when we only have points, and no edges, then we also want to extrude them. So if there's only a point, also extrude that. Shift A, we need a Boolean math node set to OR, because I need to join two different Boolean statements together. So either the top extrusion, or we want to use mesh vertex neighbors. Um, so to explain this, if you have a point here, and it is connected to two edges like this, this has 
one, two vertices as its neighbors. That's how this is. You could replace vertex with edge, but essentially that's what it is. So if it's not an extruded point, then this vertex count will equal zero. If you want to use the new mesh topology nodes, come in here. You also have edges of vertex and you can do the total is equal to zero as well there. Vertex count is just the same. So let's plug this one in. So now it works the first time because we have points and this is valid. And then after that point, you have an extruded edge. So this is no longer valid, but we always have that first extrusion which is marked as top. And now every time we go forwards, we just add 20 vertices. So this is going to play a lot easier for us. Now these are all going in a random direction or not random, actually specifically away from zero. This is also not what we want. We want to give this a little bit more control. So let's move this through a noise field. Let's first of all, rename these nodes. This one is going to be our point selection. Make sure you're keeping stuff organized here. And these are going to be our input points. All right, let's deal with our offset because that's going to give this a little bit more interest as we go through here. If we just add a texture, noise texture, I'm going to set this to 4D because I'm lazy and I want the W for my seed. I'm going to take my color, which right now is between 000 and 111. And I'm going to set a mid level with a subtract vector math node. If I set this all to 0 0.5, then rather than 0 to 1, we now have minus 0.5 to positive 0.5. This can go into our offset. Let's go back one. And now when I play, you can see that we are walking through a noise field. If I reduce detail to 0 and scale to 1, let's reset this. Now you can see that we've got some sort of curl noise stuff going on. This is always super satisfying. I love this. The fun thing about using mid levels in this way is fundamentally, it's not that complicated, right? It's a node group, essentially, it's just exposed and information goes through it and then it gets looped every frame. So you just have to kind of think ahead a little bit, do some of these extra bits of Boolean math to give yourself some information as well as storing named attributes. I'm whistling through this because as we go through, there's some more interesting stuff that I want to get into that is going to make your simulations a bit more uh, responsive. So let's get through this first part nice and quickly. So we've got a noise texture and rather than going 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, if I reduce the amount that I subtract in the Z axis, let's go back to the start and we can see this. So if I reduce this down, you can see that we can end up going straight up because my Z is now between zero and one. So if I set this to maybe 0.2, then we just get this kind of walk going straight up. It's very fast. So let's change our offset scale to maybe 0.2 as well here. And there we go. Now it's a little bit slower. Just means that that extrusion is basically a smaller step each step of the way. Now, the next part of this is going to be how we get different noise per strand. And it's actually very straightforward. Each one of these, I'm going to call it a spline. It is actually just a string of mesh we can deal with as a mesh island. So mesh, mesh island, we can use the mesh island index as our seed value, essentially our seed. So let's multiply this to make it bigger. Just because otherwise there's, if I just plug this directly in like so, and I reset my animation, do you know, actually it has done a fairly good job of splitting this out. The lower your noise scale, the more similar this will be. So I generally just multiply this by 10 or some larger number, just to give me a little bit more sort of guaranteed variation between the strands. The next thing that we want to do here is to branch. Branching is a bit of an interesting conundrum um, and honestly not one that I fully understand. So I would appreciate some feedback on the process that I'm going to teach you here. So how do we branch off? What are the rules? So after a certain number of steps, we want to have some probability of creating a new spline that goes off in some new direction. The way that we can do this is we can duplicate a point. And 
if we then rejoin it. So let's go ahead and do that. So Shift A, Geometry, Duplicate Elements. I'm going to drop this underneath here. We are interested in duplicating a point from our extruded mesh. Let's go with once. You'll see why <laughs> the fewer is better. As we multiply, because we have more points, you'll end up getting more faster. Actually, what I want to do is do this after the store named attribute, and we need to make a selection. This selection is going to choose which of our points are going to get duplicated to become a new branch. Let's just have a think about this. First of all, I want to have a like a certain distance traveled before or a certain number of loops traveled before we split off and do a second or a third or a fourth split. The way that we can do this um, is not with a loop count value. There's no count for the number of loops we're in, but we can set the probability based on the index of our points. But if we look at our indices in the spreadsheet down this left hand side, we can see that they just go up forever for all of it. We want to work it out per string, per mesh island. Shift A, utilities, accumulate field. The accumulate field is a sum loop, so the first point plus the second point plus the third point, and they will count up. If I use the mesh island index as my group index, then it's going to start from zero every time we count. So this trailing value, if I set this to integer, we are going to add one for every point we reach. So the trailing value is going to start at zero and it's going to add one for each point, essentially the same as an index. So we can use this. We can say when our accumulate field trailing value is greater than some value here, we can use this as our selection for duplicating points. In fact, if I just plug this into the output straight away and go forwards a step, now we can see that all of these points have been created. If I change this, let's say maybe to 10, nothing's been updated. And if I go forwards another step, everything is deleted. Have a think about why this might be. Think about how loops work, think about where the data is coming from, and think about what we've told it to do. Why has this happened? So the issue is that essentially we're telling this to create an extrusion. So it should be fine to take these points back through, extrude them. But then what we've done is we've said, well, only duplicate points which have a greater than 10 um, index. And that first point is not going to have that. So essentially we're not duplicating any elements and therefore we're not passing anything through. So what we need to do actually is to join the store named attribute to this duplicate elements. So now what we have is the original branches coming through. Let's just go back to reset, come forwards. Now you can see, okay, we have this awful system, <laughs> but it's working as intended. Very dense, but what's going on? Essentially, every point with an index greater than 10, if I come back here, there we go, we've split. So every point, it comes up to 10, and then when the index is greater, it will duplicate that point. The next loop it comes through, it will extrude that point as a new branch. And because the branches all have a unique noise, they're going to go off in a different direction. However, the next frame is going to duplicate another edge on this point. And then the following point is also going to get an edge. So now the first one has two, next one has one. Do that again, you have three, two, and then one. 4, 3, 2, 1. And you can see how this very quickly becomes a nightmarish mess. So we need to do something intelligent here. Every time it duplicates a mesh or it uses a point, we on the next loop need to block it from using that point again. So we need to store a boolean for when we duplicate. And then on the next run, we need to read it and say, no, don't use that. So let's come in here and do that. So in parallel to our duplicate elements, we're going to use another store named attribute, which I'm going to call block. And this is going to be our blocker. It's actually going to use the same attribute or the same field, I should say, this Boolean. So when it tells this one to duplicate, it tells this one to add that vertex to a block list. And then what we need to do is we need to subtract using a Boolean math node on here. So we want to subtract some boolean block from this list. Shift A, input named attribute. Now we want our block list. 
which is going to be a Boolean. And then we can plug that into our subtract here. Let's reset our session. And there we go. All right. So now this is said extrude and don't use this point again. And something that is interesting about the extrude node is actually as it extrudes, it will propagate whatever values are on it. So if you extrude a point, it will essentially copy the values from that point, which means that every sort of string as we go forwards, it's only going to actually split once. So you might want to do some additional logic to change this. In our case, this is actually fine because each one is going to split after it gets 10 further. There we go. We already have something that's quite beautiful. There's a bunch more stuff we might want to do. So for example, we might want to add a random Boolean to this value. So we say instead of every time you reach 10, we might change that. Or maybe we want to add a random value into here. So let's, let's do that maybe. So we're going to use the island index as the ID. So this is basically going to set what the random value is per strand. And then we can say a random value between say three and 15. So now some of these are going to split earlier and some of them will split later. And some of them are going to split wildly. <laughs> this is one of the things which I don't quite understand. So if you are more au fait with what is actually going on here, why this just explodes like this, please do let me know because it is, it's like it reaches a tipping point. Now I'm quite happy to leave this as it is because I don't really want the full animation anyway. So we're going to keep it somewhat reduced. And in, in fact, instead of doing this random value, let's change this to the random Boolean so that we can set a probability. And I will also set this to an and in here. So another Boolean math node set to and on this greater than with our random value here. So now let's do a random probability per point. So using this trailing value, and we're going to set the seed so it's different for each string per index island index. So now I can set my probability something fairly low because we end up with more and more and more points. I want to have as low probability as possible just to make sure we don't get an explosion going on. Let's reset this. There we go. That's a little bit more uh, predictable. All right, we want to keep combing this. It's all well and good having stuff just controlled by noise, but we're artists, we want control, we want to know what we're doing. So let's make sure that we do. Let's frame all of this up so that we know what it is. Control J, this is our branching probability. Like this. Let's come back here. We're interested in working on our noise textures. So let's find where it first branches. Here is a good example. At this point here, I want this to actually branch in the same direction and then come off. I want it to feel like it's split rather than just abruptly grown off at an angle. We can do this because we're dealing with information that is going through a loop and being fed back to itself. We can actually have some really interesting controls going on. I want to know at each point what the direction is for the point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to capture that direction attribute capture attribute. I'm going to put that here. And the reason I'm doing this capturing here on this mesh is because we're dealing with a noise texture, which is randomized per mesh string. And if I just find out what the noise texture is on the point, well, we can see that that's clearly different. It's going off in this direction rather than this direction. So I need to make sure that I'm capturing this value that goes up our main string. And then I can transfer it to the point that's here. And then I can use that to just give ourselves a little bit of interpolation so that we start there and then we go back to our own noise. A couple of steps to do this. So we want to capture a vector on the point domain. This vector is going to be our subtract value here. This is our direction. So let's go ahead and rename this node to direction. We then have our extrusion. We are storing a named attribute. And then subsequently, what I want to do is I want to store another named attribute on my duplicated points. This is going to be a vector, which I'm going to call DIR for direction. This direction value is going to come from this captured direction value. So this captured direction becomes stored on our duplicated elements. And then when they go around again, then they get extruded. 
they're basically going to hold on to this direction. And that's very useful because it means that we can do an interpolation here between the direction that's coming through and the new direction of the noise that it's going to get. So let's just join those two together. Shift A, we want a utility mix node set to vector. And we are going to be interpolating from uh, the value dir, so that attribute we just stored, input named attribute, vector dir, there we go. And we only actually want to do this when it exists because it's not always going to exist. It only exists on these duplicated points. So if we just run this um, like this, and let's say we put it completely into that dir value, we get no extrusion, right? Because we're doing 100% of a value which does not exist. In 3.5, we actually have this exists attribute here, this Boolean, so we can just use that. Shift A, let's use a switch, so utility switch. I'm gonna set this to vector, and I'm gonna be switching between this attribute if it exists, and if it does not exist, then we're going to be using just the noise. So just, just as if it was not plugged in. Once we've got all of this plumbed through, we can actually start working on our factor. This is our interpolation. So when we have two things like this, and we want them to split like so, rather than just cutting off like that, what we do is we say, while your index is below some value, interpolate from this one to this one. And this is nice and easy. We're going to use that accumulate field again. So just the same as we did down here. I'm in fact going to just copy these mesh island and accumulate field. It's Alt P to bring that out of that frame. We're going to be counting up in ones. This gives us our index. Let's take our trailing value through a map range. And we're going to say index from zero to, let's go with 10, is going to be an interpolation factor from zero to one. So by the time we hit one at frame 10, we're going to be using 100% of this noise. Up to that point, we're going to be using the direction. So let's go back to the start and let's see how this works. Okay. So now you can see this split here is going out here rather than it just stepping out directly. Now we follow that initial tangent and then end up going in the correct direction. We can reduce this even further. Let's maybe go down to five. Let's see how this looks. That's a little bit more abrupt. That might be good. Maybe we even go down to something like two. That's a little bit staggered. So I'm going to go back up to five. I think that was fine. And that just makes these forks, these splits look a little bit more natural. The cool thing as we leave this running is this is going to keep thinking, right? So each new one can split again. You can see they're going to split, they're going to split, they're going to split. And we end up with this denser and denser kind of network going on. What about the next thing? There's always another thing we can do. So in terms of control, we've got all of our general, it's noise and it waves around and it splits nicely now. The next thing we want to touch on here is how do we make it follow a surface? This is a process, <laughs> so just bear with me here. Go ahead and add a Suzanne mesh or whatever mesh you want. I'm going to give this some subdivisions. I want it to be smoother. So I'm going to come in here, just add subdivisions. Let's go for maybe two. That'll be fine. I'm going to apply that and I'm going to shade smooth. So now I have my model. Uh, I'm going to drag it into my node tree and I'm going to hit relative in here. How do we make things follow a surface? This is actually an interesting process. It's easy once you know how, if you aren't that familiar with vector math, this is going to be a bit of a process for you. Just stick with me here. What we have is our object. And I'm gonna set relative just to make sure that as we move this object around, it stays relative to where I put it. The next thing I want to do is we're gonna be taking this noise texture as it is here, and we're gonna be feeding it into a couple of places. We want this to just walk around the surface. To walk around the surface, I need to do a cross product operation a vector, vector math, cross product. And we're interested in taking the cross product of our noise, which is just an XYZ vector at this point, 
and the normal of the surface. What the cross product does is it will take an axis. So this can be our normal. This is our face. So we have our normal coming up here directly perpendicular from the face. We then also have our noise texture, and this can be in any direction. For the sake of this, let's say it's going over here. And we have some angle in between them. This noise texture could actually be in any direction, but what the cross product does is it will return a vector which is perpendicular to the triangle made from the two vectors that you put in. So we have essentially this vector which is always, because it has to be perpendicular to the normal, it is always going to be walking horizontally across the surface. So that's where this gets interesting, right? Because we can start accumulating data as we loop through here, we make an extrusion, we detect how close we are to the surface, and if we're close, we walk along the surface. If we're further away, we can just keep going up. And as we get closer, we can walk more and more along the surface. So there's a little bit of interpolation and a little bit of vector math. We've got our noise going on here. Let's actually just frame this so that we have it. This is our noise. We have our Suzanne monkey here, and I actually need to sample the normals off here. So let's do a mesh sample nearest surface using the geometry and this is going to be a vector with the normal coming through the value. This comes into our cross product like this. I think this is probably good practice. Let's just normalize the noise as it comes in here. So let's use a vector map normalize. This is just going to make the noise size equal one. It might have the effect of speeding it up. We will see. We might need to scale this down afterwards. This basically just makes this a little bit more predictable when we do the cross product. And then we can use the cross product up here. So again, I'm going to make some more space here. Move these all back. And that's because this noise as it comes through here, this is now going to come from our cross product. So let's come to the end of our simulation. Let's view the outputs. Let's make sure that we've got this selected so we can see it. And then as we play, it's going to race around, but it's essentially is they're not on the surface, which is why they're getting further and further away, but you can see that they're walking around the shape of Suzanne. It's a little bit crazy at the moment, but this is just because we haven't really added any additional controls. One of these controls is going to be a, a, a proximity control. So we want to, once again, use another mix node, and we're going to be mixing from the normal noise, just the regular noise, to this um, surface version, with some factor. And this factor is going to be controlled by the geometry proximity, the distance here from the faces. So let's just put this through a map range like so. And I'm basically going to say when the distance from the surface is zero, I want to use an interpolation factor of, um, let's flip these two around actually, let's put our cross product into the top and our normal noise into the bottom. Doing it this way means that our cross product is going to have an interpolation factor of zero. So when the distance is zero, the factor is zero, and it will 100% use the cross product. When the distance is one, it's going to be using 100% of just the noise. So it will just go straight up. Now, is one enough? Let's have a look. Let's move this object up just a little bit so that we grow up to it. And then Okay, it's a little bit crazy. It goes too fast, in my opinion. Let's maybe increase our minimum and decrease our maximum a little bit. So it's a bit fast. I Let's mute our normalize. Let's see how this does. That seems a little bit more predictable, actually. So we are clearly getting kind of stuck on the surface, but I think that's okay. Maybe we just bring down this amount a little bit further. Let's just control X on that normalize. Let's restart this. Okay. Now, the really cool thing about this, hopefully you can see this okay, is as I move this around, the animation is going to react to it in new locations. So there we go. The idea is that these don't want to go through her. They don't want to just grow through. They want to realize they're about to hit her 
and then divert. This is how mushrooms grow, this is how plants grow, this is just how a lot of stuff happens. So here we go, this is our section for responding to a mesh, control J, F2, respond to mesh, and then we have our mix, this is going to control the difference there, and then we have this section up here, which is smooth splitting. There we go. Now at this point we probably want to try tackling skinning these meshes. We have an object, we have the meshes extruding, or the, the lines I should say extruding, but we're not actually creating a mesh that we can work with visually, we can't render this. Let's do a very simple just mesh to curve, and then curve to mesh. We're going to be using a curve primitive curve circle as our profile curve. And there we go, that's nice and easy, might as well fill caps. Let's reduce our resolution to something sensible like 16 and we'll reduce our radius. Or will we? We want to have some control for our radius because we want these to feel like they're growing, right? Right now, looks fine, looks perfectly valid. Let's turn off my wireframe drawing for now. It looks okay. But not perfect. I want these to taper nicely, so let's add a set curve radius in here. And just for the sake of experimentation, let's also add a spline parameter node with the factor. Now I want to invert this, so I'm also going to add a utility math node set to subtract, and I'm going to subtract it from one. There we go. So now it's zero at the tips, pointy tips, and one at the base. Do you notice any issues? As we climb up here, this splits off and it says, oh, I'm the start of a new spline, therefore I'm going to be wide. We want to do some maths just to make sure that we're starting at the right width, the correct width, every time. It always wants to know exactly the width of where it's been duplicated, right? But this value changes over time because if I come forward, let's find one as it comes in. There we go, here's a new one. The underlying mesh this one that's growing off to the side here is becoming thicker and its factor is changing as it grows. So we can't just transfer the data. What we need to do is something a little bit more intelligent and I'm sure somebody will tell me there's a faster way, but for now we're gonna go the, the hard math way. It's interesting, um, but it's a process and it's all part of this kind of looping, storing named attributes, reworking them later. The way that we're going to work out what this value should be is instead of using the spline factor, we're going to use the index. So if I have two splines coming up like this, and this one is going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, let's go up to 4. And this one is going to go 0, 1, 2, 3. I want the ends to end up equaling zero, right? And I want the bottom of the bottom to end up being a value of one. So it's wider at the bottom, skinny at the top. For me to make this work without having this issue where the zeros are always the widest point, which will give me an issue here, I need this point here to know that it actually came off at two. We're going to do a little bit of maths. There's a little bit of kind of data back and forwards here. This is one of the interesting things about using these loops, it's kind of exciting when you start getting into it. I've got my store named attribute and I'm going to add another one in front on this duplicated element. I'm going to call this one br for branch underscore idx for index, so branch index. It's going to be an integer and what it is going to be is the value basically of which index this point has along its own line. So we're going to do the index accumulate thing again, so island index accumulate field it's going to come over here and I need to know what this value would have been over this side. Now I could capture it but this time let's try a sample because these are some new nodes and we should get used to them. Let's use our geometry sample nearest because I want to know what the nearest value is to this duplicate elements point because it's going to be on the same position so let's grab our store named attribute down into here. This is our sample nearest. We also need a sample index. This just passes out an index value. So let's do sample index as well. 
we're going to be transferring or sampling an integer value in the point domain and it's going to be this trailing value which doubles up as our index when we are just adding one for each point so trailing remember it starts at zero leading will start at your first value so we want to start at zero we can then transfer this into our store named attribute node and now later on we should be storing the value per spline that we have in our br index this is something that we can now use so let's come forwards uh, i've got my mesh to curve set curve radius and curve to mesh what we need to do is set our curve radius a little bit more intelligently so we have a few bits of information that we can use here we have got a curve spline parameter we have the spline index and this is a point zero one two three four five whatever up the length this is essentially the same as our accumulate field is doing over here we just have it because we have curves now we have this implicitly so we can use this index and we need to manipulate it a little bit so i need the spline index i need the named attribute br index that we have not yet made uh, so to just trigger that to make it i just went forwards a frame by pressing right and we also need a curve spline length point count so spline parameter and spline length these are a little bit different even though they both have the length on them this length is the total length per spline from start to finish and this length uh, like this this one sort of increases as you come up the spline right so it, it's counting up what the length is at each point that's what this is the spline parameter counts up from zero and the spline length just gives you the values of the spline if we think about our tree again we have two branches we have zero one two three four we have zero one two Our spline length is going to give us a four, 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 basically the length of the whole thing with our point count. And in this one, it's going to give us two, two, two. It's always good to have a real think about the values you're using. We also have our BR index. So in this case, it's going to be zero because this one starts at zero and it doesn't have the value transferred to it. So it will just read zeros. And this one is going to start at two. So we're going to start here. In fact, just for the sake of demonstration, let me make this one go up to three, just to make sure this is really clear what we're doing. So we've got threes for our total length, and we've got two for the position that we started at for our BR index. To make sure that as we change this around, what we want to do is if we add BR index to each of these, then we're going to end up with five, 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 five. And we're also going to end up with five, four, three, two, where we meet this end here. This one, we're going to end up with four, 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 and four, three, two, one, zero. So this is still the same, right? We've just added zeros to it. This one has now been changed. If we add in each of these, we're basically going to make this meet in the correct place. So shift A, you want a utility math node set to add. We're going to take our point count, add, BR index. We are also going to do the same thing with our spline parameter index. So both of these are now added to the connection point, which is either going to be zero or some value. Once we've done that, we can just subtract one from the other. Basically, just how we did the one minus the spline factor, we essentially have the same thing here. So starting at some value, for example, four, if we go our solid value, which comes from this top add from the point count, and we subtract from that the counting up version from our spline parameter now we have a count that starts at zero at the end of our line and runs all the way down it so this is pretty cool it runs all the way down and it always meets in the correct place we just now need to divide this by something if i just plug this directly into our set curve radius everything goes crazy because it's I divide this by some large value then you can see let's look for a split here's one you can't really see it because this here has the same radius 
it's all been fixed up. All right, let's just carry on. So rather than just doing this divide manually, I want to set this intelligently. Uh, and to do this, we're basically going to find out what the maximum value is in our set. To do this, we need an attribute statistic node. We're interested in counting a statistic on some points. And this statistic is just going to be from this subtract. So let's plug this in like so. And then let's just use a map range. It's always easier. Utility map range onto this subtract. I'm going to take the minimum and the maximum value. I can just control H to hide all of that extra stuff. And now I have radius controls. So right now it's going to be zero to one, but I can do something more interesting with this if I want to. For example, I could add some noise into our maximum size. Shift A, texture, noise texture. And let's set this to 1D. I want this to be just running up the length of our spline. Let's use a spline parameter node, set to length. Um, this is going to be important, right? If I use the factor, let's put this through a map range as well, just so that we have some control. So the factor into the map range, this map range goes into our two max value up here. You can see that this is sort of moving around. If I make this more obvious, and there we go. As these grow, you can see that noise sucks along the row. I don't want that. Though. So let's use the length instead, because the length is going to keep adding to itself. It's not going to slide, right? As a piece is made, it's going to hold on to that size. Let's reduce our detail. Let's reduce our scale until we've got something lumpy, but in proportion, something around here. Um, and I'm going to make this much less abrupt as well, 0.2 maybe to 0.8. And we're going to go from a minimum value of, let's get 0.7 to maybe 1.5. There we go, just so it changes a little bit. Let's also increase our minimum value here as well, just we don't need to come to a point. Let's go maybe to 0.2. Okay, this is all coming together. The final main thing to turn these into mushrooms is going to be caps. We don't have any caps on here. So I'm just going to copy this object from my previous file. And it is literally just half a sphere with the bottom cut off stretched vertically and a couple of extrusions inside. It's very simple. I haven't done anything special here. So it's just that. I'm going to put this into a collection on its own, just hide it away. And then in my node tree, before the curve to mesh, because obviously I don't want to instance it on here. I want to instance on points on our set curve radius. Let's pull this cap in. We could do this as a collection if you have multiples. So just this, it's going to go into our instance and we can view the output. So right now we have way too many of these caps. We want to make a selection of just the endpoints. So endpoint selection node, get rid of the start point. And now we can see that these grow in the correct positions. There we go, that's pretty nifty. There's clearly a lot of them going on here. And they're not following important stuff like curve tangent. So let's set our rotation up here. This is just very standard stuff. Now align Euler to vector. We want to do the Z axis is going to be aligned to the tangent, curve tangent node. And then to stop these from spinning, we also want to align while locking the Z axis because we've already worked this out going to align either the X or Y, doesn't matter in this case, to the curve normal. There we go. And that's just going to stop it from spinning. We also want to set the scale. And that's a little bit more interesting. If I just drop these down, that's fine. They grow extremely quickly. But what we really want is every time they start, every time the spline they are on is short, we want these to have a small scale value. And the way that we can do this is with our point count node. Let's use the point count through a map range and basically say, if you are in your first hundred frames, for example, then we're going to grow from 0.1 to one. And I'm just going to plug this directly into the scale. And there we go. Maybe one is too high. 
Let's pull these down something a bit more sensible. 0.4 seems about right for this one. You can always put a random value in there as well if you want some randomness. So between 0.3 and 0.5 maybe. It's looking pretty neat. Uh, I think this grows way too fast. So let's have a look at adding a bit of animation control. I'm just going to frame this up. Control J. These are our caps. Let's just join up our mesh, curved mesh, with this instance on points. This is looking amazing. I love it. I might want to have a little bit thicker stalks. Um, to do this, we can just use our map range down here. And we can increase this. Or even, we could do it a bit easier. Oh, we could increase our curve circle plenty. That was very low on mine. Just do this however you think fits best. We could also set this up um, with some function of the, again, the point class, because right now these are starting super wide. It looks a bit weird. So let's just add a multiply on here. So another math node set to multiply like this. We are going to use a spline length node. The point count here goes through a map range. Once again, map range is your go-to node, honestly, for everything. If you're not comfortable with a map range node, get used to it. It will be such a superpower for you. So let's say when our point count goes from maybe zero to 50, we're going to go from some small value here up to one, just so it grows nicely there. Let's maybe use a smoother step so we get some interpolation. The smoother step is like an S curve rather than it being just a linear, a linear thing. I think these caps are too big as well. So we're going to just reduce those a little bit. 0.25 to 0.5. Four. That should be fine. So weird looking, but I love it. There's a lot you can do with geometry nodes. If you want to make these look different, the fundamentals of how we make the splines is pretty much consistent now. It's just storing attributes and doing extrusions. So the next thing I want to do, perhaps the last thing I want to do actually, is just set up the animation control. It's very simple. The speed of the animation is controlled via this extrusion. If I set my extrusion to be slower, we have half the speed. If I increase the speed, you can see they race away. What I want to do is I want to have this controlled by some function of the frame count. So let's add in an input scene time node. I'm going to put this through a map range node. Once again, you need the map range node. Our first frame is going to be frame one. Our final frame, let's go with 300 frames. Um, and therefore my animation is going to probably go to like 280. So it doesn't completely stop, but the growth will stop. I'm going to set this to be linear. We're remapping one to 280 to be zero to one so that I can put this through a float curve. So now I have animation curves. Right now, it's just going to go zero to one as we go. Um, and actually, I'm going to use this through a multiply into this offset scale. So the fastest I want this to grow is probably 0.2, right? Uh, you can see if I just play this, it's going to start really slow and it's going to speed up a little bit up until everything is just going at 0.2 but we've multiplied far too many times by then. So this is how fast point two is. I would say that's pretty quick. Let's bring it down to zero at the start. We're going to go up to one in the middle and then we're going to bring our end down to stopped again, just with a little bit of fall off. So they're going to grow briskly. And then if we go around here. We're starting to slow down a little bit until we come to a stop. So that's fun. We're getting some weird glitching with our tangents though. So I might want to bring out that long section just a little bit there. So if things want to grow up a little bit quicker. And then they can slow down. Let's have a look down at our other sections, do we want to change some of our probability? Um, 
I'm not sure what that was connected from. Was that even coming off? What is this? What is this? Freaking experimental builds. This greater than though. I've got this set to 10. Let's maybe go 15. So more frames before we start splitting. And the other thing we want to do is reduce our distribute points on faces. Just uh, let's have a look at the output of this. Just until we have only a few points here. You could always do this, you know, more analytically. You can do loops back to back. And actually, I want to show you a little bit of how you can do loops back to back. So fewer mushrooms. They're growing over the surface. They're still splitting. And they're going to grow up nice and tall. We can, again, reduce the speed. So if you want to go down to point 0.1. I really love how they follow the surface. It's so cool. There we go. You got your little, a little mushroom colony that will follow Suzanne. If I want to move her a little bit, maybe if I just go into edit mode here and duplicate a couple times. So cool. Simulation nodes, really, really fun to play with. So something just worth being aware of with your simulations. If you want to do back to back simulations, let's say you've added your simulation output node and then you've added a simulation input node. These are now paired. Let's come off our points to vertices and let's just join this three. Something worth being aware of. If I push my timeline backwards, so essentially uncaching your geometry nodes, decaching them, you can see that all of the previous nodes have a time above them. This is important because only the nodes that are being computed show the timing. If you don't have timing, it's on this drop down. This is a problem because as soon as we start playing an animation, so going forwards, all of the prior values disappear. And this is because as soon as the animation starts or as soon as the simulation starts, this is a closed loop. You can read it out at the far end but it's not going to read in any more data. You would have to sort of join it in again if you needed it. Why this is a problem is if you have another set of simulation nodes. So if you're doing these in series, right? If you have something like this happening, the problem is because as soon as this one starts doing its loop, it's going to ignore everything that is happening in the previous loop. So you can do nested loops, that's fine, but doing them in series like this essentially turns off the one before. Whatever its input values were, they become fixed. So how do you keep these evaluating? I know this is a bit abstract, but if you run into it, this is the solution. Uh, in, in terms of like an example, something, for example, when I was planning this one with the branching, I just thought, oh, well, this is fine. I've got my extrusions set up in the first one. I will just take the result of this and I will randomly select some points to become the branches and I will just do a second extrusion pass. This did not work because this second loop closed off the computation of the first one. The way to get around this is to remember that you don't have to have anything coming in. You can do something like like this, right, where you just have a join geometry. So in this case, we still have the computation coming through and then it gets frozen, right? As soon as this loop starts, that input gets severed. It just becomes like a cached thing at this point. And then we start looping. And then this one is going to join up and then it's going to go through the process. It's going to basically start in the middle. But because we're always joining to the closed loop, this one is going to keep computing. So if you need to do them in series, this is the way. It's a bit weird because obviously this one doesn't have a connection, but it has like a, a silent connection from the output. And that's how you have to think about it. So these loops prevent prior computation. It's fine if you can work out a way of putting it into a single loop. Um, and really the trick is using named attributes branching and rejoining within that loop and having some kind of escape clauses for, for example, using your accumulate fields or with our point selection, 
We're using the top attribute, but we also just use points if they exist as their own selves. So that's about it. This has been really fun to get to learn the new simulation nodes. If you do get a chance to play with simulation nodes, share with me what you come up with. I find it really interesting to see what people are making. There's a lot of very new ideas coming out at the moment, which are really exciting. So there we have it. Hopefully you've learned something. Hopefully you've had fun and I'll see you in the next one.